All right. So just this is just the summary slide, the kind of major points of this whole lecture right here, the stuff we're going to go over. I will read them here, but you can kind of get a sense before we start walking through them. The topics I'm going to be going over. And a lot of this is really, really basic stuff right here, but it's really important, you know, cell transport stuff, the transmembrane proteins that we'll be talking about a lot next time. This is going to coincide with that. So those are really important, the most important kind of cell physiology type of material that we'll be covering. And along the way, I'm going to kind of bring up examples of where they're going to come up later in Bio 145, right? And then these are the kind of learning objectives that are related to them, right? So the first topic here is the general idea of diffusion, right? which is this process in which random mixing of particles in a solution occurs because of the particle's kinetic energy, which means in this case, you're putting a drop of blue dye in this water right over here, right, to become a solution. Right? You have the solute and you have the solvent. And then these molecules in here, these blue dye molecules, have some kind of kinetic energy, right? So they're moving around, they're bouncing around by themselves right there. And as they do so, they start spreading out. And they do that in an area, they spread out toward an area of lower concentration, right? So they start off in this one big drop, right? They're moving around, they're bouncing around each other. And then as they do that, they start spreading out because as, as they move away from other ones, they stop bouncing around less, right? Until you come to a point where they're all still moving around, right? Dynamic, right? it's all still moving around, but there's no net movement, right? Over time right here. Right, so you can imagine here, everybody enters into this room over here and they start dancing like that. They're bumping into each other and this guy's, hey, let's move over here. It's a little more, less crowded. And everybody starts kind of doing that until everybody's pretty much evenly spaced, right? So they stop bumping into each other, right? Because that's that movement, right? They're bouncing around, they're hitting each other. And as they go to areas of lower concentration, right, they stop hitting each other. So they start slowing down, right? So this is the whole idea of diffusion. Right? It's the actual kinetic energy of the molecule, whatever that is, right? just that its own inherent energy. And just to be clear, the molecules are moving toward an area of lower concentration because they're not bouncing into one another in that low concentration area as much. So there is what you call a net movement, that is overall movement in the direction of that lower concentration area. The molecules are moving just as much in the dynamic equilibrium state, just not in any particular direction. That's what's happening here, right? You don't need anything like uh, gravity, right? You don't need any force pushing them over there. You don't need any electromagnetic force or anything like that, right? It's just random movement over here. They're bouncing into each other, and then they end up interdispersed, interspersed over here, right? Like pretty much evenly distributed around, even as they're still moving, right? But the net movement is toward that area of lower concentration. Basically, your properties, right? Again, this is a passive process, right? That is, it doesn't require gravity or electromagnetic forces or anything like that, right? It's just the kinetic energy of the molecules themselves, right? Uh, and the trend, right? The movement, the net movement is toward this from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And this is called, this concentration gradient is also referred to as a chemical gradient, right? As opposed to an electric gradient that will see ions, like charged ions move through, right? They're gonna do both. They're gonna move toward their, uh, you know, positive is gonna move toward negative, but also toward their concentration, their chemical gradient as well. And again, this is a net movement Right? That is, they're all moving around everywhere all the time, but the overall movement is going to be from high to low until you get this what's called dynamic equilibrium, where things are bouncing around, but there's no net movement toward one place or another. They're just randomly moving around. It's called equilibrium, right? When the concentrations on either side of this are equal, there's no net movement. And then it's going to be much faster, right, over as you move from this area to this area, and then as it goes along, it's gonna kind of slow down, right? As molecules are stopping, bouncing into each other, right? 
and it's going to be directly, that is, it's going to be very dependent on the temperature, right? If this was ice water, this would happen very, very slowly because the molecules have very little kinetic energy. If you start heating this water, it'll happen much faster. And all you got to do is think of putting some sugar and some water or something. If you heat that water, it's going to dissolve much faster, right? And that's purely due to the temperature. You're adding kinetic energy to the molecules themselves. And so there's more movement, the more movement and the faster this diffusion happens, right? And then if it's proportional to temperature, it's also inversely, that is the, the bigger the molecule is, the more it weighs, the slower it's going to diffuse over there, right? So very small molecules rapidly move from one area to another, bigger ones move slower, right? That's pretty, uh, pretty intuitive, right? And the last thing, you know, this is across an open space right here, like this open system. Or it can also be across a partition. And what we're talking about here, right, for our purposes in this class, right, the open system could be considered like the interstitial fluid, right, in between the blood vessels and the cells, right, this is good, this kind of property is going to take place. Or it can go across a partition. And in our case, that means a cell membrane. So this brings us to this transport across the cell membrane, right? And so in the case of diffusion, we have these small molecules that can get through this lipid bilayer, right? And there's a high concentration over here. And then over time, because they're bouncing around, they can move through this lipid bilayer. You'll have equal concentration, right? So there'll be a diffusion from high to low concentration through this membrane right here, right? As long as it can get through that membrane. And so, so far, not really much has changed, right? There's probably a little bit of a slowdown right here, but otherwise it's the same kind of thing as our just normal diffusion, right? So these will be, who can do that, right? But these small nonpolar solutes, right? Oxygen, carbon dioxide over here, there are just two atoms, three atoms over here that can easily pass through this cell membrane right here. And the fact that this is a lipid bilayer, right, which is going to be kind of a, uh, remember, like dissolves like, right? In other words, these are nonpolar molecules. This is a nonpolar area, right? They can move through this whole lipid bilayer very easy, right? Because like dissolves like, right? You can, they're both soluble in this lipid soluble bilayer right here. So these are little things that could pass through very easy, right? Uh, but remember, what is the function of the cell membrane, right? It's to kind of separate this from this over here, right? And so we want to let some stuff in. The cell wants to let some stuff in, like oxygen, and let some stuff leave, like carbon dioxide and waste, right? And it will, but basically it wants to keep a particular kind of environment out here that's different from here in order for it to kind of survive right here. So the cell membrane isn't just letting everything in, it's gonna be what you call selectively permeable. So when we're talking about the lipid bilayer here, right, you have these small nonpolar molecules, oxygen, carbon dioxide, nitrogen, right? They can diffuse very easy through this lipid bilayer, right? And then very small, uncharged, even if they're polar, water, uh, ammonia, glycerol, these are very small molecules. They can get through not quite as easy as the small nonpolar molecules, but they can get through and some of them are repelled, you know, based on whatever, right? But they can get through. Uh, other ones, large, uncharged, charged or not, right? Even if they're not charged and especially if they're polar, glucose, sucrose, they're too big and they're, they're repelled by this lipid bilayer over here. So they're not, for the most part, getting through this lipid bilayer right here. These are these small molecules versus this big molecule. This is glucose, charged ions like that. Notice the size right here between oxygen, carbon dioxide, very small. Water's actually a little bit smaller than these two over here, but because it's a polar molecule, it's not going to go through quite as easy. Even though it can make it through uh, for complicated reasons, uh, these are going to make it through much easier right here. So this one, I don't know if you ever saw that scale of the universe kind of thing, right? Right here, 
that we're looking at, you know, the scale of things. And here's a red blood cell, one of the smallest blood cells, right? It's got a cell membrane around it. You can't see it quite yet, right? But when you zoom in, you're looking at all the things. And there's our virus. It's about the size of a coronavirus there. And then if you could see this little thing right here, that is your cell membrane right there, right? Just to go back. And so that's what you're looking at just for scale purposes. And so here we are with our cell membrane. Now you're beginning to see it a little clearer. And here's that phospholipid bilayer. Here's an individual phospholipid molecule. And then you can see over here, you got that glucose molecule just for size. Zoom it in, there's the phospholipid molecule, there's the glucose molecule just for scale, right? Just to see what we're looking at and think about things passing through it. Phospholipid, glucose. And then over here is the water molecule, right? Just for kind of, just for size when you look at the difference. There's that water molecule, keep an eye on it, keep an eye on it, right? That's the phospholipid layer you've got to go to. So some of the cartoons you see are a little bit, uh, to me, they're, they're a little bit distorting. It's charged or not, right? Even if they're not charged, and especially if they're polar, glucose, sucrose, they're too big. And they're, they're repelled by this lipid bilayer over here. So they're not, for the most part, getting through this lipid bilayer right here. And ions, these charged ions, don't get through at all, right? They'd be attracted to the phospholipid part, but they can't get through this at all because they're charged. And these are nonpolar. The fatty acid tails don't like any kind of charge over here, right? All right, so that's that lipid bilayer. Lipid bilayer, that's the selective permeability of the lipid bilayer. But the polarity thing is going to make a big difference, right? Why is water not getting through as well as oxygen carbon dioxide? Simply because the polarity of it, right? The, that lipid, that those fatty acid uh, tails don't like polar stuff, right? So these, so simple diffusion, right, is going to happen through a cell membrane, right, through the lipid bilayer, right, without the help of anything else, right? They could just diffuse through, right? These are small nonpolar solids moving down their concentration, right? But the cell membrane is more than just the lipid bilayer. The cell membrane uh, is not only the lipid bilayer, but also these proteins these proteins that are within it, right? So these are going to add to the permeability because they're going to let other things that the lipid bilayer wouldn't let in, right? So the membrane permeability, when you talk about the permeability, it's not just that lipid bilayer, so you don't just think of the, you know, the fatty stuff, but, you know, these are going to let some stuff in, right? They're going to be very selective, uh, but they're going to let some stuff in. So when we're talking about these, this we'll talk more about this on Tuesday, but you know when we talk about these processes, by which molecules move through them, we, we talked about this simple diffusion swings going through based on their concentration gradient. Uh, but you know the most of what we're talking about are going to be mediated by these transient proteins, right? And so depending on makeup, you know what kind of transmembrane proteins are in there. Uh, that's going to, you know, define what a cell's permeability is. So you could have these ones that just help it get through and they're going to go through on their concentration gradient or ion channels through the electrochemical gradient. And then we have these water channels basically, which are going to be a large part of what osmosis is. So the permeability of a, a cell, right, is going to depend on these channels right here. And then next time we'll talk about you know, how we get stuff in against their concentration gradient, basically. So the permeability is due to that phospholipid bile and the transmembrane proteins, right? The phospholipid bilayer is the bilayer that doesn't really change so much, but these protein channels, you know, what exact protein channels are in, uh, whether they're open or closed and everything is going to determine any particular cell's permeability. That is what comes in and what goes out, right? And these channels like that could be very tightly controlled, right? So 
here's the lip bilayer. Here's a couple of these uh, cartoons and uh, of these protein channels. Right? Uh, and here's a looking from the side. Here's looking down on you. You can see that they're kind of. This is probably the hydrophobic regions that's interacting with the internal part uh, in the middle right there. And then this might be you know something else to let polar molecules through, right? The, the domains over here are going to be hydrophilic or something. So stuff can go through there, right? pass through these into the cell right there. Right? So these are these channels that are embedded, these integral proteins that are embedded within the lipid bilayer. So here's an example, big example of like these channels, right? These protein channels that let water molecules in. Because again, even though water can diffuse through there, uh, it really mostly due to these uh, water pores, right? These are called aqua porin channels. And again, you can think of these positively or negatively charged things that are going to let these water molecules through over here, right? So if you want to add more water permeability, you just add some more of these channels into the cell membrane, right? And it'll increase the permeability of water to that, right? So why would you do that? Here's an example. Don't worry about the details right here. This is something you'll deal with when you get to the urinary system, but it's an example, right? Here are these cells, right, that are lining some of these kidney tubules over here. And there are times when you want to increase uh, the amount of water that's reabsorbed, that is taken out of your urine. And so to do that, you just add these water channels in, and presumably you add them on this side too, and so you have these water channels all ready to go in the vesicles. They fuse with them over here. And now all of a sudden you got excess water permeability. More water goes into these cells right here and you reabsorb more water, right? This is the action of uh, vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone, right? But that's just an example, how you can increase the permeability of a cell or a whole cell lining right there, uh, membrane lining, all right? So uh, all that permeability, right, uh, the selective permeability is going to create this, these gradients, right? These concentration or chemical gradients, right? Which would naturally move from high to low, right? Are going to be kind of stopped or influenced by these, by the whole selective permeability, right? So if you had a concentration gradient out here, and they could get through this channel very easy, then you would, this concentration gradient would become to equilibrium. But if this thing couldn't get through there, right, then you got a buildup of stuff on the outside here uh, that wants to go in there, but can't because it doesn't have a way in, right? So we can maintain like a high level of these purple things out here, and maybe a high level of the, you know, white things over here inside here based on the permeability, right? These concentration gradients, right? And these are going to be huge in like these cell functions we'll see later on. Same thing with electrical gradients, right? We can let in a bunch of potassium or something like that, right? And keep out sodium, right? And potassium will flow into the cell because the cell's interior as an overall negative charge because of all the proteins and whatever reason, there's a negative charge. So the positively charged potassium is going to flow in according to its electric gradient because they're positively charged and they're attracted to the negative. At a certain point, they'll stop based on their concentration gradient. And then they'll reach kind of, we'll talk about that, this equilibrium later, but they'll, they're free to go in. There's less sodium channels over there. That's much more tightly controlled. So what that means is you get this excess bunch of sodium ions, chlorine too, stays out here uh, outside and excess potassium inside, right? So you're changing the permeability of these, of the cell membrane by adding more potassium channels and sodium channels right here. You could also close these channels off, right? And totally change the dynamics of this or open them wide, right? change everything. We'll see that in the nervous system, right? It's much more skewed toward the electric part of it, right? That's why potassium uh, flows in, but stop, it flows in, you know, toward this negative uh, electric gradient, you know, electrochemical gradient in here, uh, 
the, path, the positively charged ones flow in here. Uh, and they'll go way against their concentration gradient because of that. Right? That's why you have a buildup of potassium. But mostly it's a combination. I think the electro part is much more powerful. So, you know, all this selective permeability, right? You're going to change, you're going to kind of create these sort of uh, inequalities between the outside and the inside of the cell because of this, right? And you could change the permeability uh, just by adding the channel, closing them. And you could also regulate those channels, right? With hormones and stuff like that, or certain conditions, right? As we'll see again during the nervous system. And, and other places. All right, so that's the selective permeability right, of the cell creating these things, right? And so uh, because of that, we got this concentration outside of cell, concentration on the inside, and the bigger this gradient is, that is the more there is of something out here, the stronger this push is to get in here, right? So if you have a big concentration gradient, there'll be a stronger sort of uh, drive to get inside the cell to kind of equalize that out, right? So that's one thing that's driving the rate of diffusion, right? This concentration gradient and the permeability, right? The other thing is molecular size, right? Uh, big things can't get in very easy where other small things could, right? And of course, you know, the lipid solubility, right? Which is due to the composition of this lipid small, Nonpolar molecules make it through easy. Polar and charged molecules do not. Right, so what we're getting at here is some of the factors right, which are going to influence the diffusion across the cell membrane. Right, another one is the surface area of the cell itself, right? So these are, you know, in your learning objectives somewhere, right? I ask you for the factors which influence the diffusion rates across membranes. And so these are some of the ones, and I'll give you some examples uh, of these as we go along here. Right. So we're gonna talk about surface area over here. Uh, when I last, those simple columnar epithelial cells, they had this microvilli uh, on the apical surface uh, over here. Now, if this cell was like this, you would have this much surface area. And over here, you got all your digested particles that you want to get inside this cell right here because you've just done all the work of digesting it and you want maximum surface area for it. So instead of having this much surface area right here, you got these microvilli, right, which are going to increase the soup, the thing like, you know, a thousand fold or whatever. I'm making up the number, but it's increasing that surface area over here, right? So that's going to greatly increase right, the diffusion of stuff or the transport of stuff into the cell right here, right? So the surface area is one big factor right there. Here's another one for surface area, your lungs, right? You got these two gigantic sacs over here. You could kind of feel with your hand or so the width of your length of your hand if you stretch it out about the length of your lungs, right? So they're like, they could, you could think of these as two big balloons, like two big air sacs, but in reality, uh, these are all those air sacs are all made up of millions and millions of these little air sacs right here, right? So instead of one big balloon, you got millions and millions of little air sacs that make up your lungs, right? So those air sacs, what they do is change your lungs, which, you know, surface wise, if you just cut them out, they'd be a size of like a, a newspaper, right? Now you're making it into the size of like half a tennis court with all of these little air sacs right here, right? So you're increasing the surface area. So again, this is just another example about the surface area needed for diffusion. Right? Uh, and here's one of those little air sacs. This is a, you know, a bunch of them, a group of air sacs right here. Um, there's like one, two, three, four, five, let's say 15 sacs in here, 15 little individual air sacs within this cluster over here. For people with emphysema, right? long-term smokers and everything, you get this alveolar, this air sac, the walls broke down. So now you have one big air sac and you've just lost all that surface area right there. This is one reason why they have trouble breathing, right? And they're not getting the oxygen in when they're breathing in stuff right here. Because you've just lost a massive amount of surface area by destroying these little walls right here. Right? And again, this is something you'll get into with respiratory system, but you know, we're just, we want to kind of 
look at this and why we're talking about this at all. All right, so here's one of these little air sacs over here that we were just looking at right here, right? individual air sac, air, that you breathe it in. If you breathe it in through your nose, uh, the air has circulated around your nasal cavity. It's warmed, it's humidified. And so when it comes down here, it's a little warmed up and that'll increase the diffusion of oxygen and carbon dioxide in and out right here. So temperature is going to increase this surface area, uh, increase the diffusion rate through here, right? Another thing is, is that here is the deoxygenated blood coming through here, right? And so the concentration of oxygen is very low here, very high here, and the concentration gradient, the oxygen will diffuse into these cells, like through these two layers into here because of this concentration gradient. Same thing here, CO2 was high in here because this is the blood that's been used and CO2 is low, hopefully, you know, over here. So CO2 is gonna flow out its concentration gradient uh, at the other end, right? at, at the same time, right? And so you could breathe that out, right? So concentration gradient. And then these are both small molecules, right? So the mass, this, this is very rapid kind of gas exchange happening here because these are both very small molecules. All right. So those are just some examples. Here's another one, right? Diffusion distance, right? Same thing. We're still looking at those alveoli, those little air sacs, right? And there's a, what's called a respiratory exchange membrane, the little simple squamous cells. Remember those little flat guys, very uh, flat, good for gas exchange. It was lining the alveoli here and it's just sitting right up next to these capillaries in here. Right, so you can see this is the alveolar sac right here, the air sac, and diffusion is very fast because this distance is really short, right? Usually you have a lot of interstitial fluid between the blood vessels and the cells. Here you have like minimal, right? They share a basement membrane, et cetera, et cetera. You'll learn all about it when you get to the respiratory system, but minimum distance, right? Diffusion distance, very fast uh, gas exchange, very fast diffusion. Where is this applicable also? Right. Here's that same picture right here. Now we're looking up a close up here, ASAC blood vessel, normal interstitium, right? The fluid, a little bit fluid in between them, rapid oxygen into the blood, rapid CO2 out. If you've ever heard of fibrosis, like lung fibrosis, if you've had heavy damage, perhaps like due to a respiratory infection, your lungs get all messed up and you get the repair process leaves all this scar tissue right here that's gonna increase the diffusion distance, right? Making it much harder to obtain oxygen and get rid of CO2, right? This is lung fibrosis, but what you're doing here is increasing the diffusion distance, right? It's very simple concept, right? Just longer to travel through there. Here's another example of diffusion distance and surface area, right? Surface area, uh, we're talking about all those alveoli given extra surface area. Well, if those little air sacs are filled up with water, which just happens in pneumonia right here, acute respiratory distress syndrome, as it might be in a respiratory infection that shall remain nameless. Right? When you fill these little air sacs up with fluid right here, this is an inflammation response. The oxygen comes in. Number one, you have a loss of surface area because the lungs, the, you know, the little air sacs are filled up with fluid and the stuff that does diffuse through has a much longer way to go through, right? So you've increased the distance in between where it's exchanging uh, between the alveoli and the capillary here. I'm not gonna ask you anything about alveoli. I might tell you exactly about them and then you can kind of explain, all right, now what does this mean? Why is diffusion slower? Because you've increased the distance, right? So, these are just examples of you know what the rate about the rate of diffusion, all right? So this is you know the kind of take home of all that. This is just the uh, you can read that and get a better idea.